Welcome to the Musician's Toolbox. I'm Andrew. And I'm Angela. And here on this uh, podcast, we interview people to see what tips and tricks they would give us to be successful in the music career. And we make content for all musicians, whether you're young or old or hobbyist or pro. Um, I think we can get you some tips that you will find interesting. Every Friday, we release a new episode. And these are very inspiring interviews uh, where we talk about practicing and mental health. And in this episode, we will be talking more about mental health. And we have a very exciting guest. Angela, will you tell us about our guest? Today we have with us a licensed clinical professional counselor. Her name is Lori Miller, and she is on staff at BYU-Idaho counseling students there. So thank you so much for being with us yes, today, Lori. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We are stoked. Um, so just to let us know a little bit about your journey and your path of how you came to be a counselor, could you give us like a brief background of how you got to where you are today? Sure. Uh, so I... I had thought about it and like, oh, where do we start? So I originally, when I went to school as a traditional student, um, I was and I still am, but I was very interested in like business and accounting and really interested in the economics, um, right? So you can totally see why I'm a counselor now. But, um, <laughs> and, I, right, and I, I'm still interested in those things. And then um, as I went to school and I was one semester away from my bachelor's degree in in business management was what my declared major was. And my husband and I had our first child and my plan was to go right back to school and, and finish up. And then when we had him from the, like, and it was moments from like not having him and I'm pregnant to all of a sudden there he is. And I'm like, ah, plan B. And like, and it really felt like the world kind of shifted like, oh, plan B. Um, I'm actually going to only just stay home at least for the next year, right? And then, and so I did, and it was more than a year. Um, but, and then we, um, my husband started working, he finished school, he started working, and then, um, and then when he went back to school at that point, when he went back to finish a doctorate degree, um, our youngest was starting kindergarten that year. So I had another child in that time, we've got two kids, and I felt like, okay, now I'm ready. I'm ready to go back. And in that time, and I just, I, on one hand, I wish that everybody had the opportunity to really get to know themselves and live a little bit of life before having to make those career decisions because it's, you know, overwhelming. And I do mm -hmm. some career counseling and I, I don't give people the idea like, hey, you should take 10 years off of school and then <laughs> go back because um, I don't think most people could do that. But um, I was gratefully in a position where I was able to do that. And then while we were living in, and my husband finished, his, did his doctorate work at Northwestern in Chicago and we lived in Chicago, um, I had an experience of... Um, of really my first time really like living in um, a racially diverse and culturally diverse area. And also we lived in a pretty like impoverished area where we were students. And so we didn't have a ton of disposable income. I didn't have a ton of income actually at all. Mm -hmm. And so we, we lived in a place where like for the first time I really lived among like real like poverty, um, of, you know, like a, not and not just money, like but financially and kind of seeing that cycle and realizing that like, oh, like some of the ideas I, I believed my entire life and I, I still believe that anybody can be anything that they want to be. But it was my first time experience like, ah, oh, but our starting lines are in different places. And I just I was like, oh, I I want to be a part of a solution. Um, to, to like, I want to help people, right? So any any counselor, one of the questions you always get asked is, mm -hmm. why did you go into counseling or social work or, um, if you're a psychologist, psychology? I want to help people, but but really like, oh, I, I want to have better tools, um, to be able to help people instead of like this sometimes toxic positivity of like, you can do it, pick yourself up by <laughs> your bootstraps, um, but actually kind of I wanted to understand like why do we do the things that we do. And so then at that point, I started a bachelor's degree again, but my, this bachelor's, so I know that I'm one semester away from a bachelor's degree in business. Um, and I really, and it was like an internship and I think two credits and, and, I, wow. and I still uh. would be done. Um, but I'm like, oh, I, I want to do this, this, I want to do counseling. Um, so, and I, and I want to do counseling like with kids and young people and, and older people too, but really like, I was thinking like school counseling is what I was thinking at first. And then, um. I started my bachelor's degree is um, from BYU Idaho uh, because my husband's a professor there, right? so I get this great tuition benefit <laughs> yes. uh, in marriage and family studies or science, so relationship 
um, relationships, basically like systems, family systems. And then I have a master's degree from Idaho State University in counseling, a master of counseling, uh, with the clinical, with the mental health emphasis. Um, I chose it the, after finishing my bachelor's degree and knowing that I, I, where I live, I live in Eastern Idaho, um, and I knew I wanted to, like, to do counseling, and I was really worried where I live if I'd be able to get hired on to do mm -hmm. counseling, um, often in schools, and our schools are no exception. The, when budget cuts happen, it's often those areas that get cut, and I wanted to, to work. So I went the clinical route, and, and here I am today. Cool. I really love the, your, what you said about wanting to find tools that were actually helpful because I know that has been a huge frustration in my life of lots of people that have wanted to help me, but they haven't had useful tools other yeah. than, like you said, like, just go get them. <laughs> and it's like, but you yeah. don't understand all the things that are playing into the situation or how to even help me do that. So um, I think it's so important that we all have at least access to these kinds of tools at, at, at parts of our lives so that we can really be successful. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. I really yeah. appreciate yes. it. Yeah. Um, so we, we want to kind of see how we can apply a better, healthy mental state um, and help our listeners as musicians to kind of cope with things that I know both of us have experienced at different to different degrees. So one thing that I've noticed that as musicians, especially in the classical world where you're playing the same piece as literally thousands of other people, mm -hmm. especially yeah. when you begin, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a violist and Suzuki books, <laughs> everyone has played Suzuki book one, right? <laughs> so, um, so you find yourself in a place where, and even when you get more advanced, like there's so many people that have played the Tchaikovsky violin concerto or the waltz and viola concerto or whatever. So what is it about our nature as humans that makes us have this tendency to compare to one another, like to other people? And is it always harmful to compare? And how can we, how can we like make this not always a negative thing? Or can you talk about um, comparing and how we can make this a, a not so negative in our lives? Yeah, absolutely. So that comparison piece, like it gets a, it does get a bad rap. Like I, I can think of like even church lessons when I was sitting in church as a teenager, like, oh, don't compare yourself to others. And even now as a not teenager sitting in like, oh, comparison, like it's a thief of joy. And, and those things, those are true. I just, I think it's funny. It's, uh, I just, it's, it's us talking out of both sides of our mouth. Um, mm -hmm. We know that most little kids, you know, and you, and um, Angela, you have a beautiful, very little kid. I mean, mm -hmm. she's, uh, and she's lovely. And, um, but Right, that they're happy and like they just do what they want to do because it's fun and right, like and, and everything's fun. Like, oh yeah, help all the help on all the dishwasher. <laughs> um, and like, and they just and it's and they're so darn fun. Um, and they generally generally feel pretty good about themselves. Like, I think it doesn't even really occur to them to not. Like, it's just like, <laughs> oh, this is my world and this is how I roll through it. Um, but we know that most kids experience a dip in self esteem or drop in self esteem or. Um, like their, their self-acceptance, um, when they're about school age, mm. Uh, mm. when they enter kindergarten, first grade, and I, I don't think that's, I don't think anyone thinks it's a coincidence, um, and the research doesn't think it's a coincidence either, uh, because that's when we really start comparing ourselves to others, that's what school is, right, are you, how, how are you stacking up against your peers, mm. are you reading, are you writing about the same, same neatness, same level as, as they are, that's literally what school is, right, this percentile, the curve, like, it's comparison to others. So I think it's hilarious. We tell people, don't compare yourself to others. <laughs> but we're literally comparing them to others, just even in school, right? And, and that, that doesn't change. So I don't know that we can get away from comparison. I don't think comparison is necessarily bad if we're careful with it. Um, so it's not a huge surprise then that then you get musicians who've gone through school who continue to compare. And how do you get a job, right? It's, you're being compared against others, and they're, mm -hmm. they're picking the best one. Um, the one that you know seems to most fit their needs or, or kind of presents the best. So I think we have to make peace with the comparison. Um, and uh, the best way I know to make peace with anything is with self-compassion. Um, the I, 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 I've not done my own research on self-compassion as far as like I've not published anything, um, but Kristen Neff has and even has a great website called um, What's her website called? Self-compassion, probably.org. I'd have to look it up. I should have looked it up before. 
Um, but if you just Google Kristen Neff and self-compassion, um, but really what, what self-compassion is, is it's talking to yourself and really relating to yourself as you would a dear friend. Um, to get back to, I mentioned just briefly in the rapid fire questions, the, um, that how most of us talk to ourselves in a way that we would never talk to another human being ever. And thus we were exhausted and hungry and so frustrated. Um, and then we might blurt something out of anger and then feel horrific about ourselves, right? But we just keep talking to ourselves that same way. Self-compassion is recognizing when you do that in a, um, in a non-judgmental, so taking some mindfulness here, a, your, a non-judgmental, mindful awareness of what's going on in your present moment, including the way you're talking to yourself and even being something like, oh, I'm talking really mean to myself. Um, and I have like a whole little funny thing I do in my head that I'm like, oh man, we're being hard on ourselves right now. We don't talk that way. We don't use those kinds of words up here. Like, and I really do have this conversation with myself and I know it's happening. I recognize it's happening. Um, and then, right. And then like, you know, let, let's, let's use nice words up here. Um, that's, that's kind of, that's how we're supposed to talk to, to people. Um, the, and, and self-compassion, just to be very clear, isn't like, oh, I'm great just how I am. Uh, I don't need to like work towards goals, or, right? <laughs> it is accepting, like, I, I really am great how I am, um, but I feel good about myself when I'm working hard and, like, and trying to make progress towards. Self-compassion isn't laziness. It's not letting yourself off the hook. Um, but the research actually shows us that self-compassionate people are actually more productive mm -hmm. than those of us who are critical. Um, when I'm working with clients and I say, you know, how's, that, how's it going on up there? Uh, Often, the, one of the main pushbacks, and it's like it's predictable, is like, well, if I don't talk to myself this way, I won't get anything done, uh, mm. which is a lie, uh, but we believe it because, because for most of us, we've done it as long as we've had an internal voice, which is usually about the time we're three, four, five ish, is when we start to develop that internal voice. Um, and most of us, our internal voice sounds a lot like our most critical parent mm -hmm. talking to us, um, and then we kind of even spice it up even from there. Um, so the, it, it is probably true that that is how most of us motivate ourselves is by calling ourselves horrible names or putting ourselves down or shaming ourselves. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the most productive way that we can talk to ourselves and motivate them. It just means that it's what we've done. And so what, what we've done, what, what's familiar, that feels safe. And it is full-blown scary to think about doing it another way. Uh, so I don't expect people to take from this like, oh, I just need to talk. I just need to talk kinder to myself. That's all I need to do. Um, it's true you do, but it's not quite that easy. But um, but it also isn't quite that hard either. Um, so yeah, that self compassion piece. Uh, it's not indulgence. It's just talking to yourself like you would talk to a really good friend. And it's avoiding words like should, um, mm -hmm. must. Just is another one that, especially as women, that we throw out. We actually do use it more than men do. Um, it's a super like minimizing thing. Um, sometimes it, it, it's okay. I don't think we need to get rid of the word just. But um, there's a psychologist um, that talks a lot about not living a shitty life. Um, stop mm -hmm. masturbating. Right? Like, stop. <laughs> stop telling yourself that you're not living the way that you should. Um, that should word, I think, is a you know, I, sh I should get this. I should be better than this person. I should be, I should be, I should be. And very seldom is that actually us being compassionate. It's just us beating ourselves over the head with the, the ways that we're not good enough or we're not better than other people. So again, getting back to like, I'm just going to start. I'm just going to start being nice to myself or noticing when I'm being mean. And then, like, the motivation's going to follow. If you've ever trained a dog, uh, we humans are not dogs, but we can be trained not unlike a dog can be trained. Um, if you've ever followed a dog around with a piece of newspaper, right, to hit them every time they don't do what you want them to do, you're going to end up with a dog that is just helpless, like that is learned to be completely helpless. Um, and most of us know that, right, that we're not just going to, and if, it's a good gut check too. If you, you got yourself a toddler and you keep, all you ever tell that toddler is no, that's a great, that's a powerful word. And then <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, explaining to your treating yourself the same way that you would treat a baby that you love and that you that you want to treat, treat well or a dog um or really anything else that motivating yourself through like being a cheerleader like the best kind of cheerleader for yourself like oh wow look what i did i whether it's oh my gosh i got out of bed today and showered 
uh, that's awesome. That's a win. <laughs> or, oh, I, and look at, and I, I touched my side in the olden days, used to play the bassoon. Like, oh man, I picked up my bassoon today. That's, I really didn't want to, right? And being able to be honest <laughs> with yourself, like, I really didn't want to start this. And look what I did. I, I did. Versus like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be as good as other person. Um, like that comparison, using that comparison to like motivate ourselves is super demotivating um, because we tend to see the things that other people do really well and compare it against the things that we're doing really, that we perceive that we're doing poorly and missing all the stuff in the middle. So Chidera just learned the word no literally the day before Christmas. It's an important word. It's a, such a powerful, important word. But I, I have worked so hard to keep her, you know, when she does something I don't want, I always say, uh-oh, instead of no. And yeah. people have actually commented, like, she doesn't say no. And then literally it just popped. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so, it's such a good word. It's, a good, it's such a powerful word. And But yeah, yeah, nothing like, oh, I really could say that. Uh, I could a little differently yeah. well but I think that as I was reflecting on this question before I even asked it to you I think that um it is interesting that we default to those most fearful motivating experiences that have become from external means and then that becomes our default for internal yeah. means um and I've also noticed that as I've been more surrounded with people that don't motivate that way that those inner voices aren't as loud anymore. And I ha I, it's even without me trying, that negative self-talk is so much less and it's not so knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. for me. So it's, because it, my husband is the antithesis of all the things that we do as Americans <laughs> yeah. in, in talking to ourselves. He just, should is not in his vocabulary. Uh, what? And yeah. it just, it, he's just, I don't understand. Like, that's not, I don't do things because other people do them, you know? So it's just interesting that, that's um, the, the, I, I think it's something that we struggle with that perhaps in other parts of the world that it's not culturally mm -hmm. yeah. might show up differently for other, other mm -hmm. cultures definitely for sure, for yeah sure. show up differently that's a good yeah. way to put it I have a quick follow up I really like what you're saying but as as a young person I've always younger person I mean I'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> that kind of sounds dumb well, I'm much <laughs> as a young you, person but I get it yeah no I would but, say you're a young person uh -huh. but I've always been confused by like um mindfulness and self-compassion and you've said some things uh like um but would you just clarify what are some ways that people who are not exactly sure what they can do to start on how to not compare themselves or how to how to change that. What are just some ways that people can start on the stuff that we've just talked about? V, I would say like for uh, I'm not gonna say I've almost said the most important way, but that's not <laughs> fair. I don't know if it is the most important way, but the first way I would start and when I'm working with clients, the first thing that I have them start, and it, I mean I've given this homework assignment thousands of times um, to a thousand thousands of different human beings not the same although sometimes the same one like have you done the homework yet well you need to get back and do it but number one is becoming aware that I'm doing it like oh man and, and I talk to myself like that a lot oh man I am being really negative with myself or whoa we're doing a ton of comparison right now and it's not the fair kind of comparison mm -hmm. right because because there is some like oh I'm that, that, that the whole identity comparison, right? That, mm -hmm. That's how we form our identities, comparing like who I am to somebody else. Like, who do I want to be? And we do it by like, who are all these people around me? And do I, do I want to line up with this? Do I want to do it different? And a lot of that happens kind of in a, a less like aware place. So kind of somewhere maybe back here. But um, like I would say number one is just letting yourself become really aware of your present experience. We kind of live... Um, that most of us live our life being told that we shouldn't feel bad. Don't feel bad. Oh, uh, stop crying. Don't don't be sad. Uh, you shouldn't be. Yeah. And, don't feel um, that emotion. <laughs> don't blink. Like, yeah. Oh. And I think that's always, always meant with love mm -hmm. um, when people say that. But it also is a much more like, oh, that's a you problem. I'm kind of like, <laughs> oh, I see that you're uncomfortable. Thing. See, you're, you're probably uncomfortable mm -hmm. with sadness or fear or loneliness um, or anger. Uh, so trying to like outlaw it on our kids, I, I think as parents especially we do that. Like trying to like don't don't be that way. You put put a kid in time out or whatever to to not get them to be something, to feel something. But um, and so from the time that we're very little, we're getting the message um, accidentally 
from my parents like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. There's something mm -hmm. wrong with the way that I'm dealing with my internal state. There's something wrong. Um, and like bless parents' heart, and I'm one of them, and I know I've passed it on to my kids. Darn it. I met, tried really hard not to. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I know I did because it, as a parent, like it's, it's painful for me to see my kids upset. Um, it's painful for me to see my friends upset, right? It's painful to see, my, to see people that I love hurting. Um, so for many of us, our knee jerk is like, well, then tell them to stop hurting. <laughs> Right, like it, it seems logical. Um, that's been in the in the history of mankind. I think it has worked zero times that somebody has calmed down by being told to calm down, yeah, or right to not feel a certain way. Yet we do it because that's what we want. I mean, we want the best way for people. Um, but so number one, though, would be uh, being aware of like what is my internal state, and again, like, and this would be mindfulness. Mindfulness is the non-judgmental awareness of your present experience. Mindfulness is different than meditation. Mindfulness is different than self-compassion. Um, mindfulness is just just your awareness. Like and and even it can be the awareness like, whoa, I'm I'm talking really negative to myself right now, or oh, I'm feeling a lot of shame about this. Right, not trying to change it necessarily, but just being aware of it. Um, oh, I'm really comparing myself to other people. Um, I am feeling really disconnected in this relationship. Oh, I'm feeling furious right now. I'm feeling sad right now. I'm feeling scared. Like be, being able to, number one, to first be aware. And even having that conversation like, oh, I'm feeling really scared and that's keeping me away from hopping on my piano bench and starting to practice. Um, and then being like, oh, what, what is it that I'm telling myself? Um, right? what, what's going on? Where are my thoughts going on that are making, that are helping me feel more scared about starting this thing? Um, right? And then and just being like, oh, I don't know, maybe it's, I'm afraid I'm never going to be good enough, right? So I'm shutting down and not doing anything or, right? But first you have to be aware of what's going on first. And there's a whole bunch we have to wade through, which is interesting, right? Because we're always in here. We're always in here in our own heads. We're the only one that's here. Um, but we're so influenced. And Angela even touched on like the fact that how influenced we are by other people's mm -hmm. internal talk that you never even hear. You don't even know what it really sounds like in there. Mm -hmm. But how influenced we are by the people that are around us that we don't even realize that we are being influenced like that. We can be a, a byproduct of their internal talk. But um, yeah, number one, I would say, Andrew, how are you talking to yourself? Okay. How are you feeling? What what's going on? What's your experience that's going on right now? Like peeking in there non judgmentally, uh, and then and then if there's something that you want to shift or change, like by a degree, whether it's like your talk, your self talk, or I don't know something else, doing that by degree, starting it rather than being like, well, I've got to. I've got so much time to make up. I'm going to go practice for the next 12 hours. And, you know, and to be clear, I, I have a neurotic type personality. Like I have an addictive type personality that I, I do tend, I trend that way. That Well, if, when, when I was um, originally, before the business degree, I studied music for a couple of years. And I was practicing consistently four, five, six hours a day, plus mm -hmm. carrying a full anyway. And like, I had blood blisters inside of my mouth and like, oh my gosh, like tension headache, like I can't even describe to you. And um, really not doing it in a compassionate, mindful sort of a way. It was miserable. Um, but that had really internalized that that's how it was supposed to be. Like this, no, this mm -hmm. is how you do it. So um, I know I wish I could go back and whisper in the ears <laughs> of 18 year old Lori mm -hmm. and be like, hey, Hey, this is supposed they call it playing music. It's supposed to be fun. <laughs> like, how can we get you back? How can we get back to having fun mm -hmm. with this again? Because mm -hmm. I yeah, I, I was able to really squelch the joy out mm -hmm. of it. Thank you. I know that uh, one thing that was helpful for me because like you said, because we're taught so often to put those emotions away instead of process mm -hmm. them, it's hard to recognize them and for me it was necessary to write them down hmm. to know mm -hmm. that that's what I was experiencing or to talk to someone about it. Mm -hmm. So like having versus, cause sometimes I would just be like, Oh, cause I think I'm feeling this way. Okay. Let's move on instead yeah. of taking the time yeah. to sit there and process it. I'm not a therapist, but I know. Which is funny. That's literally the homework assignment I get. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, like, so you, you, you would, if, if you, you wouldn't, right? Cause we know each other, right? So there would sure. be an, an ethical problem with you and <laughs> the two of your relationships. But, right. um, if you, 
found yourself either face to face or for the next apparently at least the next six months this way mm -hmm. uh, like the first the very first time we met um, I would very likely, unless there was something kind of else that popped up instead, but I would very likely give you the homework assignment so that, okay, the next time you come back, um, I want you to, uh, to pay attention to this next week. And I'd probably start with self-talk, uh, but sometimes it's emotions. It depends on if someone's done work before they've met me or not. Um, and then, but then I have them, I, I want you to write down every time you have this thought, like, or you call yourself a name, right? I want you to actually write it down. Um, and part of that is... Or feel that way every time you feel sad. Like, I want you just one time a day to take your temperature emotionally. And that I feel blank. I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel angry. I feel lonely. I feel scared. Um, because all of the, and I ordered the self-talk piece, it all happens kind of in here, in our brain. And so it's invisible. Like, you, you can't mm -hmm. touch sadness. Mm -hmm. You can feel it and be able to, like, really describe how it shows up in your body. Uh, but the, I like the writing down specifically uh, because it, it's taken it from this world that we tell ourselves it's somehow like, oh, we minimize it out. Like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's just in my head. Um, but to like, oh, no, like this is a tangible thing. Like, I, I really was feeling sad, right? And that sad feeling, it shows up in my body. It's tightness in my shoulders and maybe it's here. Maybe it's a squiggly feeling in my neck, whatever. But um, but that, that writing it down, taking it from the invisible to the visible, like making it real, validating it, and then... Um, and then doing with what you need to like right crying is a really appropriate response to sad mm -hmm. or you know or right our basics happy sad angry lonely scared and then probably shame should be on there too yeah but um right feel and we do this too this culturally like we we mm -hmm. flip flop what i feel and what i think mm -hmm. um that right no i get a thought is a sentence i think that da, 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 da. i i feel that's a word I feel scared. I feel lonely. I feel sad. Um, the I've cut off more than one client, and it gets to be like a joke. It's like where I'm like, whoa, that's so that one. You said you feel like they're not listening to you. You actually think they're not listening to you. You probably feel unheard, or you feel lonely. Mm. Right. Um, right. But it's it's that that difference, like just that kind of emotional, it's emotional intelligence, um, which is not my word. It's John Gottman's word, with lots of words, but that's. John Gottman's done a lot of work in emotional intelligence. Um, so letting yourself be curious, which is the opposite of judgment. Be curious with yourself. Be curious with your emotions. Will also help you be more curious with other people's emotions. Mm -hmm. We can't tolerate on our partner what we can't, what, what we're not willing or we are against the rules to tolerate in here. We have to, or any of our friends or family, or we have to be able to tolerate it here first before we're going to tolerate it on somebody else. You'd be surprised how much release comes from giving something a name. Yeah. So For sure. Mm -hmm. I have felt it 100%. It's like, oh, I felt sad, and then I cried, and then it was gone. It yeah. just went away. Uh -huh. I, I did like, with it what I needed to do. It did its job. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I, don't have to, I don't have to think about this tomorrow or in a month mm -hmm. or in six mm -hmm. months. Like, it's literally gone. It has no more space in my body. Mm. So, anyway. Yeah, that's, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the another thing that happens with musicians is we obviously perform. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been happening since <laughs> March. <laughs> Hopefully so, it's, it's a perfect world. <laughs> I perform. <laughs> hope you live a less than perfect world. Yeah. <laughs> but at some point, I think we're going to have to get back on stage mm -hmm. and, and, you know. We hope. I yeah, hope. we hope. Yeah. And deal with anxiety and nerves and distress that comes from that. So um, do you have any tricks or tips or ways that we can be more efficient about this because I, I think that it's a necessary part of performance. That's part mm -hmm. of why it's so exciting, but um, so that it's not debilitating. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, that exciting piece. Um, when's that, I, I, do either one of you like roller coasters? I do. I used sure. to yeah. love yeah. them. Aww. I used to love them and like I went once where there were no lines and I just went too many times oh I, too much I don't, of the thing yeah <laughs> i mean you could even sit in the front seat you didn't have to wait longer wow. it was a beautiful day but i <laughs> yeah. might have overdone it mm -hmm. but i think oh. in general i would say yes. I, yes I love roller coasters and but andrew you have a non-complicated relationship with roller coasters. <laughs> no, no <laughs> andrew's got a little bit complicated by <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um when you're i i don't know what 
I know what my experience is on a roller coaster. Um, but your, what, do you have like a favorite part? I know it sounds like I'm fishing here. I'm not. You can eat anything. What, what's your favorite <laughs> part of a roller coaster? Probably the lines is least favorite. Yeah. Favorite. I, don't know. I don't know. It's been so long. Um, I mean, probably like just the first, the first time. <sighs> Like when you go up, I, I'm did. thinking of the Hulk. I'm yeah, thinking yeah, of the yeah. Hulk. You go up. Oh, and I then, love the Hulk. We said it a couple years ago. Yeah. yeah, you go up and then you like zoom out of the tube, and it's just like that first, that first, like just the first, the first thing that happens. Yeah, and the as, as you're going down, um, the when you're feeling excited, I'm, I'm going to assume that the word is excited. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. In your body, can you kind of go back and break down, like, in your body, do you, do you know what happens? Like, um, and I don't need you to give me, like, the psycho like, psychological <laughs> things that are happening. Um, but, like, what, what do you know? Like, do your heart beat fast? Or yeah. is it hard to breathe? Or like, what, what, what kind of happens that builds that excitement for you in, in your body or that tells your body that you're excited? Well, I think the anticipation. I mean, like you said, the 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 heart beating exciting for excitement for what's coming up um i'm trying to think if there's anything else the, the, I, I get kind of shaky yeah yeah okay do you have like something with your breath that happens like, so i just kind of move. yeah or like <laughs> when you first go you kind of like go back and then you kind of get used to the motion or whatever but yeah. you kind of get pushed back there is a yeah, so it sounds like we have a similar love yeah. experience. <laughs> You're probably happy old and We need to address I can, that. I can uh, relate to all of these things, yes. <laughs> so I do, I love, I love roller coasters. I love amusement parks. I spend, we spend, that's where most of our disposable income goes is towards <laughs> amusement parks. We went to Dollywood. Have you, either of you ever been to Dollywood? Have you, either of you been yet? Since you have growth mindset, been to Dollywood yet? I've been begging to go to Nashville for the last year, so hopefully, but no, haven't Five been there stars. yet. Been there. Five stars. <laughs> definitely recommend. Really phenomenal roller coasters, but there's one well, and I'm not exactly sure why this one pops in my head because I've been on a lot. I love a lot. And I would say my favorite amusement park. I love Dollywood. Um, but it's probably not my favorite, favorite amusement park. But this one, we were at, um, with, um, we were at a family reunion. And I was sitting next to my brother, one of my brothers. And um, and I think it's fun with him, right? He's one of those people that just, he laughs really easily. He's really <laughs> fun to be around. He's just really easy to laugh with. And... Um, where on this one, it's not even a roller coaster, maybe I don't know if it's a roller coaster or not, I don't know if it makes a difference, but it's, it's one of the ones that, like, it's just on a pole, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, like, you, you go up, and everyone's sitting, like, on a platform, like, you're buckled in, right, it's not dangerous, <laughs> um, and you're buckled in it, and you get dropped, mm -hmm. and, but you don't know when the drop's going to happen, they have all these different algorithms, and what makes it fun is you, you don't know when, you could be up here, it's like, I'm going to throw some numbers out, I'll probably be wrong, but, um, Anywhere from like you can be up here for anywhere like six seconds to thirty seconds before uh, that first drop, right? So like, like, and you know it's and I love these things. I love <laughs> the free fall. I love all of it. And I'm sitting there and I'm screaming and like my legs are bouncing mm -hmm. and I'm with my brother Joey next to me and he's sitting next to me and he's just laughing. Um, apparently that's how uh, the excitement pops up in his body is laughter. And um, and I'm and I'm like. What have I done? Like I'm like rethinking all of my decisions <laughs> yeah. in my life up to that point, and then um, and then oh, and then it, it drops. So I did like ah, and it's fun, and then my heart's beating. I can't catch my breath, and I'm shaky, and my thoughts are so jumbled. Right, um, that it's so exciting. Now, so the heart right, and I love it. I love roller coasters, and I spend thousands of dollars. I, I, I don't really <laughs> want to actually look up and like over the course of my adult life, how much money I've spent on um, roller coasters and, and like chasing that, that exciting thrill. Um, but that excitement piece, most of us love feeling excited. Like there's that hope and all that. But if then now, physiologically, what happens in our body with a fear response? Our heart beats fast, it's hard to catch our breath, we're shaky. Our brains, um, our brains, our, that, that thinking part of our brain, it goes offline, um, right? But it's like physiologically identical to what happens mm -hmm. in our body when we're excited. Mm -hmm. Most of us are not going to pay thousands of dollars to be terrified to go out. Well, actually, maybe mm -hmm. musicians would would pay thousands of dollars to be terrified to go out on stage. Um, most of us don't spend thousands of dollars to go be scared, but mm -hmm. we will spend thousands of dollars to be excited. Um, so even mm -hmm. being able to kind of 
recognize that like and reframing it in your in your head um, I want to talk for just a minute about our brain and the fear response in our brain um, for people listening on the podcast I'm going to describe what I'm doing with my I'm going to use my hand as a model and I'll, I'll try it but I'll also for any youtubers it's going to be easier to see this is not my model of the brain I wish it was it's Dan Siegel out of UCLA uh, but it's so good and it's so convenient because it doesn't matter what office I'm in. I don't have to have like a brain model somewhere. I always have my hands with me. So um, I'm going to invite everybody to make a, so if you know American Sign Language, you'd make the letter B with your hand, um, which is just your finger straight up and touching and your thumb crossing on your palm. Um, and then you're going to fold your four top fingers. You're going to fold them on top and make a fist, but with your thumb buried inside, right? So this is the model I like to use for to talk about the brain, right? And our brain, like all the rest of our body, happens in two, right? So it would actually be like both of your fists together, but it's really hard for me to point if I don't. <laughs> so, and for whatever reason, we talk about everything like the amygdala, the prefrontal lobe, right? Or lobes, I guess we would say, but um, even though there's two of everything, we mostly refer to them in singular, which is, I think, funny, but that's how we do it. So, so this is your brain. And this would be your brain fully resourced. You're getting plenty of sleep. You're getting just the right amount of social connection for you and exercise and food and water, like all of the things. This would be a perfectly, beautifully resourced brain. Uh, and if we were to peel back the, well, really, hold on. Prefrontal lobe would be right here. The, the parts of your fingers from your knuckles to your fingernails um, would be like our prefrontal lobe right here. This is the thinking part of your brain. This is where you are. This is where really a lot of like, this is where answers to exam questions are. This is how to have difficult conversations with loved ones. This is where your personality is. This is where um, your memorization happens for music, right? This this is the a really important part of your brain. It's also, interestingly enough, energy calorically wise, it's a really expensive part of our brain to run, but it's really important. It's, it's what makes you, you. And then if we were to peel that, well, hold on. And then if you look at the back of your head, or your hand, your brain, your hand. Um, this would be like the reptilian, we call it reptilian brain or your lizard brain. This is the part of your brain where you need things, you need these things to happen, but you don't really want to be having to think about your heart beating and, and those kinds of things. They happen here, right? They're, they're pretty much mostly online. And then spinal, vital, right? It all just kind of rolls back there. Okay, now if you were to peel back your fingers and open it up, this is what Dan Siegel calls flipping your lid. But um, it's the, 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 this part of your brain goes offline, and this part of your brain goes online. This is the limbic system, uh, or like the fight or flight response. It lives here. It actually lives right here in a little, uh, a little almond-sized and shape um, little part of our brain called the amygdala. Its only job is to keep you alive when there are threats. That's all. That's all. That's what the amygdala does. Um, you, the amygdala, you'll note, is down here in the downstairs brain, not the upstairs brain. It's down here in the non-thinking part of your brain. You can't tell your amygdala to calm down, right? <laughs> it doesn't. It's not in the logic part of the brain. It's it's deeper. It's too important to keep you alive. That we don't want our thinking to take over. So, if you're running, well, put, go ahead. You can put your your lids back on. And if you're walking down the street and you turn around and all of a sudden there's a bear chasing you. Like, and you realize there's a bear chasing me. Fast, about three times faster than you can think, um, the amygdala is gonna go online and the prefrontal lobes are offline. These two are incompatible with each other. They can't both be online at the same time. It's one or the other. It's gonna be off in the time, again, three times faster than you can think. If you've ever been jump scared, like got into a room and like a sibling jumps out at you or mm -hmm. someone's in there, you know they were in there, um, right, yeah, you jump, Right, that's that going online, and then whew, see how slow your thoughts are, and then you realize, oh, that's my mom. That's not somebody here to kill me. That's you know my my mom handing me a cup of cocoa. <laughs> I don't know what, but right. So that's how fast the amygdala happens, the the fight or flight response happens, and the thinking happens. So you are. Um, oh, in this time, right, you're just you're thinking thoughts and having whatever, and then the amygdala is online. Um, in this time, your your heart's going to start beating fast, really fast. Fast is starting. Your breathing is going to change from being long and low to really chesty, really ribby. Your ribs are going to be breathing instead of your diaphragm. Um, your thoughts are going to pretty much stop um, because, and many people have even felt like a tingling or a whooshing feeling in your head. Some people have heard it. 
uh, mm -hmm. that sits out and the filling of the blood, the yummy oxygen blood that was feeding your prefrontal lobes, it's leaving, it's gone. And it's moved now into all of your lung muscles, get you ready to fight or flight. Your muscles are all gonna tense up. Your pupils are gonna dilate. Uh, what else happens? Your digestion is pretty much gonna stop. If you're about to be lunch for a bear, your body's not gonna to wanna to waste time anymore trying to get food digested into energy for tomorrow if you're about to be lunch today. So digestion's pretty much gonna stop. Uh, and right, the, and you can even feel all that adrenaline um, and all the blood and everything that's in your muscles, right? Often we kind of feel shaky. And then you're going to either outrun the bear, fight, we're going to stay and fight the bear, or freeze, that we don't talk about that as much, which is just hold really still, like playing possum, hold really still, and, um, and right, and maybe the bear will think that you're dead and not delicious. Um, you're going to either outrun the bear or, or you're not. And if you don't outrun the bear, the bear is like, thank you you are delicious and it's going to move on with its life and yours would be over. We've all <laughs> always outrun the bears, right? We know, cause we're all alive. Um, mm -hmm. And the, um, and then the, the signal for the, the thinking part of your brain to come back online is, well, it's a few things, but there's this reflex called the barrel receptor reflex. Um, and the best way I know how to hijack into that reflex is through the diaphragmatic breathing to be very clear, very often wind instrument, like wind players and vocalists tend to have a much more complicated relationship with their, with diaphragmatic breathing than the rest of the universe does. Right. Um, but the, the, the signal for when you outrun the bear for the prefrontal lobes to go back online and the amygdala to go offline is a, it's, it's diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and then you go back on your line. You could keep gathering your nuts and berries or whatever it is that you're doing, and, and then you move on. Thankfully, well, first off, that's for a that's how our bodies are, whether you designed or evolved to respond to stressful, fearful situations, is this system with the fight or flight, red bear receptor. That perfect. It's a perfect system for physical threats, things that would kill you and eat you. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we don't live in a world where we generally have a ton of physical threats. Um, we do have them, um, but they don't happen a ton. Things that would like would kill you. Um, but we have, we are just ripe with emotional threats. Things that, that would, could distance us from other mm. human beings. And I and our brains have a hard time really telling the difference. A threat is a threat is a threat. Our, our brain, whether we're being chased by a rabid dog or worried about making a mistake in front of an audience, um, right? Our brain's like, oh, there's a threat, batter up, I know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, this system, amazing for physical threats where you have to like lift the car off of a toddler or, <laughs> right, or run fast for a long time or jump from a burning building or in a car accident, right? It's amazing. It, we, we can do things that, are, that we didn't know our physical body could do. Um, however, emotional threats actually require a lot of that thinking part of our brain that goes offline. So it's, and actually if you were to test your IQ when you were fully engaged, like right, thinking part of your brain online versus offline, your IQ is gonna be, not surprisingly, a lot lower. <laughs> um, if you've ever had the experience of sitting down to take an exam, and you sit there and like, and you know you studied for it, but the, the answers are gone, right? You've had it. When we have this physiological heart beating, breathing differently, muscles, all that, when we have that response to physical threat, we're just amazed by how amazing our bodies are. Hopefully, hopefully we're amazed by that. I think it's amazing. But when we have that physiological response in the absence of a physical threat, so usually when there's an emotional threat, we call it a panic attack. That's what a panic attack is. Mm. It's the amygdala going online when it really wasn't convenient for us for the amygdala mm -hmm. to go online. It's very convenient if you're being chased by a bear. Um, it's less convenient if you're sitting down with an orchestra to rehearse something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So first off would be that coming back again, Andrew, that making peace of like, whoa, I'm having a really strong fear response. If you can even think that clearly, if you're having a full-blown panic attack, it probably just has to blow over. Um, so you can kind of re-engage and then try again, try to build up some more coping skills. Um, panic attacks generally don't last very long. They take a ton of energy. So our body's going to burn it out pretty quick. And then your brain will come back online. Um, often people feel like they're going to die when they're having a panic attack. Um, 
you're not. And I, I know that and they're horrible. If anyone's ever had a panic attack, they're terrible. And there are counseling can be really helpful. Like there are things you can do if you're having them consistently uh, or if they're really interrupting your life, interrupting you living your life the way that you want to. Um, but most of us, just have like an errant one here and there, or maybe you have none, or I don't know. But um, when you're having that physiological fight or flight response, and it's the threat is an emotional threat, which most of our threats are, um, it's not helpful to not be able to think. So hmm. it is also super complicated. Um, so when I was doing my master's work, I had the opportunity to work in the uh, a, um, biofeedback clinic at ISU. And it was amazing, it was very cool, and it's amazing just for a little bit of like training, what you can do. I did notice it's really, it was very hard when somebody came in for the music program who was a wind player or a vocalist, their, uh, the, their relationship with diaphragmatic breathing was much more complicated than, <laughs> than the rest of the world. And I actually, and I'm in that category, I spent so much time talking to myself in a nasty way mm. and being me right and, and being stressed and being worried it doesn't take me very many times to practice doing something here we're going to say by um barrel uh, receptor um, reflex but um diaphragmatic breathing it doesn't take very much time to do something one way in our brain to link it to something that we don't want it to so um but one thing that our body has built in is to calm ourselves down with diaphragmatic breathing uh and I recommend, like re the research shows us, if you can practice diaphragmatic breathing in a low stress place um, every day for 20 minutes, you're going to actually strengthen your body's ability, uh, this reflex, this baroset reflex, to calm your brain down from emotional threats really, really quickly. Um, if you have a complicated relationship, like many people who are probably listening, many musicians do, with diaphragmatic breathing, um, it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means you're going to have to work a little harder, um, <laughs> right, of course. Or, yeah. or maybe work more intently. Um, but the, yeah, diaphragmatic breathing in a relaxing place, practicing in lots of different places. Researchers found after recommending 20 minutes, nobody was doing it because who's going to sit around and breathe for 20 minutes a day? <laughs> uh, so then more research was done in five minutes. If you can even just practice breathing, mm. like belly breathing, calming, the kind it should feel really, really good. Um, and if it doesn't feel really good, then change something. If you're feeling lightheaded, that's just too much oxygen in your brain. That's not gonna hurt you, just slow it down. It means you're probably breathing out way too fast. You should be breathing really slow. Most of us should have about a 13 second to 16 second breath cycle. Where we're breathing in for about six seconds and breathing out for about eight seconds, right? So that, that mismatch there. Um, but then go about your day, breathe normal. But practice the diaphragmatic breathing. If you can even practice it during times when you're waiting, waiting for a light to change, waiting for a line, waiting like we spend so much time waiting. Even just a minute each go, each time that you're waiting, or what I do with my clients, I like to use the cue of like every time you pick up your phone. Most of us are picking up our phone. <laughs> Usually when we're feeling kind of anxious. Um, so you don't want to only practice something when you're anxious because if you do practice diaphragmatic breathing only when you're anxious, pretty quick, your brain's going to be like, oh, mm -hmm. when I'm breathing this way, I'm supposed to feel anxious, which is right. where the complicated relationship mm -hmm. happens. Four or five times doesn't take very long. But if you can practice it sitting up, laying down, laying back, walking, standing, right? waiting mm -hmm. in line at the grocery store, waiting for a performance to start, wait, if you can practice it, you know, five, five times, 20 times a day would be better, but five times a day for a minute each time, your brain is, your muscles are going to get stronger, but your brain's also going to be like, oh, when I'm breathing this way, I really, I'm already built in to calm down, but I'm also like, oh, I have the experience of like, this is a really safe way. I should feel really good right now. Um, so yes, I know it's a super long answer, <laughs> but I don't know how to talk about fear without talking like why we have mm -hmm. fear. And Absolutely. It's to, keep us, it's to keep us alive. And oh my goodness, bless our brain's heart. Don't we all want yeah. to be alive? Like, mm -hmm. excellent. But our brain kind of also has sort of a low bar of mm. like what success. Like, well, did you die? Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is like the like a very grandparent thing. Well, did you die? Did you die though? Like, <laughs> no. And like, thank you. I didn't die. Um, but I have a higher standard that I want for success in my life than just not like dying on stage in front of thousands of people, mm -hmm. hundreds of people, or tens of people. Um, so, yeah, coming back to um, number one, being aware. Uh, Angela used to call it giving it a name. Um, 
psychologists often call it internal perception, being aware of your internal experience, being able to label it, oh, I'm feeling scared. Yeah, of course I'm feeling scared. That makes a lot of sense. I've worked really hard. It's important to me what the audience thinks about me. Um, I should be feeling scared. That makes sense. Um, but, and then coming back and then trusting my preparation. But I've done everything I can do to get ready for this. I got this. Um, my heart's pounding. It's hard to breathe. Oh yeah, this is exciting, right? Mm. Using mm -hmm. that other word, changing the word, uh, which is still a true word. It is exciting. It is, isn't it exciting <laughs> to get ready to go on stage? You've worked so hard for this thing, and here you are going on stage and, and doing the thing that you've been working hard for, and then, then moving on. So, yeah, that makes sense? Yes. It's really interesting because when I was training really hard, uh, one day I went out, and I didn't know that it was called diaphragmatic breathing, but I remember being on a long run, and I was like, my breathing is really relaxed. And it's been really relaxed for a while. And I'm actually running kind of fast. I'm going to see if I can keep my breathing coordinated with my strides and see if I can go faster. And I kept going faster and faster, but I kept my breathing rhythmic to, to my pace. And it was really interesting at how fast I was able to run because I was relaxed. And that was a huge crossover. That's actually one of the reasons that I competed so much when I was working on my doctorate because... It gave me a place to practice these skills mm -hmm. when I was away from my instrument. And so I didn't have to have the pressure of what we deal with with our instruments and, you know, mm -hmm. teachers and audiences. Um, but I was still doing it at high level and I was seeing more of the physical side of it and the way that it responded. So I, I practiced mm -hmm. diaphragmatic breathing without even knowing it. That's really <laughs> interesting. Even knowing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. After okay. I'll hold it. I'm really glad that you brought that up. And... Also, it reminded me of the interview that we did with Dell. Mm -hmm. We asked him about performing and how he, how he performs, Dell Parkinson, and mm -hmm. um, and he said he doesn't he doesn't get nervous. He gets excited, and I loved bringing that up because they're the same emotions. You feel the same way, but when you look at it more positively, then it's it's not as nerve nerve wracking yeah or... in counseling we call that a reframe i'm yeah. gonna take what i've got and put a new frame on it oh mm -hmm. yeah it does there is a lot in the same like physiologically the same mm -hmm. but i like feeling excited i don't mm -hmm. like feeling scared mm -hmm. i'm gonna call this excited right? and it works because yeah. you're not lying to yourself it's the same right if if you were in the middle of a panic attack or like on the cusp of like a fire flight response and like oh i feel so calm your brain's gonna be like Shut up! No, you don't. This is horrible. We're gonna die. So yeah, yeah. yeah that that being able to reframe it of like, oh, this is this mm -hmm. is the play part of music. Yeah. This is where I get to play and, and hopefully have some fun. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna mind myself talk that I'm not gonna get in on this bandwagon that I'm gonna die. Right? You're mm -hmm. not going to die. Um, that's uh, I hope not. Not mm -hmm. from a performance, um, but. Like, yeah, it, it can be uncomfortable, but it can be uncomfortable in an exciting way. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be in a fearful fight it. Like, you kind of have to go with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining yes. us. We have two final questions. We have so much more that we want to talk to you <laughs> <Yeah>. about. <laughs> and hopefully we can do, like, another episode with you. Yes. Because that would be great. Because I have been so educated in yes, this, and I hope that too. other people have as well. <laughs> um but just to be respectful yeah. of your time <laughs> and what we, how much time of yours we told you we would take. We want to make sure that we mm -hmm. make good on that. So um, one, one thing that I am always interested in when people have achieved so much in their life um, is what they consider to be their greatest accomplishment. So this, this isn't in regards to psychology unless you want it to be, but just in general, what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment that you have achieved in life? Um... I think my personal, what I would say has been my greatest so far, and greatest is hard, that's very like specific. Um, <laughs> something I'm very proud of mm -hmm. um, is my, I've been able to really challenge and change kind of my self-talk. Um, mm. The Angela, you touched on a little bit about having a partner, right, who, who who's a beautiful example of like, being kind to himself and then consequently being kind to everybody else. Everybody. Right? Because <laughs> yeah. if, if the nastiness isn't up here, it's not going to spew out mm -hmm. to somebody else. Um, yeah. when you're not watching it. Um, something that I, um, uh, some, something, an area that I've made some progress that I'm really pleased with and want to continue is um, 
is that the way that I talk to myself and I hope the people that I love and that love me and that are in my circle, the way that I talk, I'm hoping the way that I talk to them, I hope it rubs off there too. I, my guess is it probably, I hope it has, but um, the, I would say like, um, there's like, like lower and higher, like lower would be like having a partner, finding a partner, finding friends, like surrounding ourselves around people who talk and treat themselves and consequently you the way that we all should again I use that word should very carefully should be treated um and then the other is like then let allowing yourself to grow and like to pressure yourself to grow and to be that partner for yourself mm -hmm. um like so like you've got like the like low tech and high tech low tech would be having the partner and then high tech would be like being that partner because right? you're with you all the time mm -hmm. um so i think that's probably my greatest um, the thing right now that I and I've worked on really hard, so I'm really proud of the way that I generally talk to myself. And I'm pleased with it. And I've gotten really a lot better at saying no to other people. And I think especially mm. as a woman, but I know that men struggle too, this um, having a hard time with the healthy boundary of being able to like, where do I stop and some, what, what can I do? I've gotten really good at that. And those to me have gone hand in hand. Like I, I don't owe it to myself or to anyone else to, to give, give, give until I'm dead. Um, right. That I can, I'm okay just how I am. I don't have to prove to myself or prove to other people that I'm like good enough, but like, oh yeah, we're, we're pretty nice up here most of the time. And I am really pleased with that. Cause that's not my natural state of mm. being. Is that too fruity? Might be a little bit. No, I no think that's, that's great. That's how it is. I'm pleased mm -hmm. with it. I Thank you. Yes, thanks. Yeah, and thank finally, you. this can be something that you've already mentioned, but just wrapping up, what would be some tools that you would give musicians to put in their toolbox? So number one would be how are you taking care of your body? Uh, the, um, there's a specific type of therapy called DBT um, that uses a ton of metaphor. One of the metaphors that they use um, and this is um, like as you're building coping skills, right? And remember coping, how do you deal with stress? Uh, when, that's what a coping skill is. Or, or distress, how do you deal with when you're feeling a feeling that's uncomfortable? Um, the, if you wait to develop coping skills or to practice your coping skills when you are on stage in front of the audience, <laughs> um, right, you're going to fail. Uh, it's just like learning how to play any instrument, piano, violin, vocals, any, anything. If you wait to start practicing until it's time for the performance, it's not going to work because mm -hmm. um, right? the stakes are too high. But practicing every day. So number one, we have to take good care of our bodies. Sometimes that's going to mean that we have to say no. Like, like We all only have the same 24 hours in a day, but we all have different roles and different things that are important to us. So categorizing what's the most important for me, what what's the most important use of my energy. I have a finite amount of energy. What really is the most important for me to get done and then letting go of the other things. Not that those things aren't important, but like, uh, I can't, that's part of my to-do list that's not going to happen. Maybe today, maybe for the phase of the life that you're in, uh, maybe something else. But um, being um, really kind of jealous with your time, being really careful with your mm -hmm. time and trying to spend your time doing the things that are the most important to you, uh, taking good care of your bodies, um, sleep, have to sleep, have to eat, have to drink healthy water is the best thing for most of us. Um, we have to have social connection. We have to have it. We have to have it. Um, there's a reason that solitary confinement is torture, right? And that you mm -hmm. can't do it indefinitely to even to people who have made horrible decisions and done terrible things. Um, we still have some rules that we can't confine one human from other humans for, right? We're just not made that way. So having a deep, important social connection with other people balance like all those things so um the my best like hope my best advice i worry about advice right because it's it really is like it's me telling somebody it's from the cheap seats like i'm, I'm here in the cheap seats of your life and tell you what you really should be doing but yeah um but still like we have a body they all work about the same we have a brain they all work about the same <laughs> so taking care of your body having social connection um like with our the and something that's going to shift but that we're spending our energy on the relationships that are important to us. And then last, like I, I love having fun, making sure that we're doing things in our life with a mind frame towards fun. Like it's playing music or um, I, 
I love quilting. That's where I spend most of my free time. Um, it's either thinking about quilts or actually working on quilts <laughs> or touching fabric or um, and that's what I, as you can see, like I have a mm -hmm. roll of fabric behind me, um, but letting ourselves, and sometimes it's kind of pushing ourselves to do things that kind of fill our cups. And then also using our brains to kind of reframe things in a way that it can be filling and not always draining. Mm -hmm. well, us giving, so. That's Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for making time yes, for this over this holiday season break. Um, yeah. We really appreciate the time that you've, and all of your wisdom that yes. you have imparted yeah. onto us. So well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. What a great interview. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And we truly hope that you have found some tools to put in your toolbox. Our podcast, as a reminder, can be found on various platforms as well as on YouTube. Once again, feel free to send us a DM or voice message with anything that you'd like to see in the future. Um, we often post announcements and upcoming guests on our social media, so if that's interesting to you, you should go and give us a follow. Yeah, we would love some follows. And lastly, while we do love doing this for free, podcasting is not free. So if you really like what we're doing and have uh, gained some value from our show, there are a few ways that you can support us. You could share with your friends. You could rate and review. And subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You could also shop our merch, uh, which you might have seen in our YouTube videos, or become a supporter through a donation at the Anchor Podcast link in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. See you later.